tuning into Liberty Under Attack Radio, your home for libertarianism in action. We provide you with real free market solutions using the freedom umbrella of direct action to give you the tools necessary to increase your own personal liberty. As Ludwig von Mises said, liberty is always freedom from the government. And now your host, Shane. And welcome to Liberty Under Attack Radio, your home for anarchism in action. I'm your host, Shane, and I've got an extremely, extremely special interview for you today. But first, Liberty Under Attack is covered by a BIPCOT no government license. This allows reuse and modification by anyone, except for governments and the agents thereof. You can learn more at BIPCOT.org. One quick announcement that will coincide perfectly with today's podcast. Uh, if you haven't heard already, the audiobook for Ben Stone's book, Sedition, Subversion, and Sabotage, Field Manual Number 1, A Three-Part Solution to the State, has been released. It was produced and narrated in part by Liberty Under Attack Publications and is available for free. You can listen to it on the website or you can download the entire thing. Uh, just visit tinyurl.com forward slash benstoneab. Again, that's tinyurl.com forward slash benstoneab. Now, I don't, I don't want to waste any time here because, uh, you know, kind of a rare opportunity. So let's get right into it. I'm joined by Ben Stone, the, the one and only bad Quaker. Uh, so, Ben, welcome to Liberty Under Attack Radio, sir. I mean, I, uh, I never really thought I'd have a chance to talk to you, so it, I mean, it's an absolute honor to have you on the podcast. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Thank you, Shane. I appreciate that uh, that introduction, and I really, really, really appreciate you guys. I shouldn't say guys because there was uh, it was a, a, a very mixed team <laughs> that uh, that did the recording on that uh, audio version of the book. I, I you know, I. A lot of people were requesting me to do that, and I wanted to, but uh, my health was failing pretty badly at the end of last year, and I just thought, there's no way I can ever get this done. It's going to be, you know, I, I can't even remember how many hours of it it is now, like five hours or something. Six or seven hours. Yeah, it's, almost like, yeah. it's, it's a long time. <laughs> yeah, it would have it would have knocked me down pretty bad, so I really appreciate you you folks doing that. Oh, not a problem, not a problem. And I mean, I I, I did intend on uh, was even just after reading, you know, f uh, part one, you know, starting starting to do that a few months back. I was like, yeah, I think this should be an audiobook. And I, I had plans to do it myself, but uh, you know, life happens and things got busy, and uh, I just randomly, you know, just kind of just had just randomly, you know, posted in uh, Fiendtopia, said, hey, any of the fiends want to help me do an audiobook for Ben's book? And uh, you know, I was I was you know pleasantly surprised that so many people were like, "Yep, let's do it, let's do it." So, uh, yeah. So the the volunteer effort, uh, you know, helped to get that out a lot faster, and I think that's uh, it's definitely important. And you know, it's been it's been getting a lot of traffic. Uh, so you know, there there definitely were a lot of folks that that wanted an audiobook of that. So, um, so yeah, definitely glad we could we could help you out and, and get that out to 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 the folks. So, uh, so I figure today, Ben, uh, we'll start with uh, talking about that book. Uh, one of the extremely few points I disagree with you on, uh, that is peaceful parenting being a subset of agorism, and then we'll leave the best for last, freedom, bed, and breakfast. Uh, so does that sound all sound good for you? That sounds great. Uh, can I throw in one side thing, um, and, I'll, and I wouldn't do this otherwise, I'll forget about it. Yeah. Uh, in, my, in my book, in the first section, I think it is, I talk about how uh, I'm not really addressing in the book the you know the hacker end and the whole cyber end and cybersecurity and that kind of thing for a couple reasons. One being those guys already do a pretty good job on their own. They don't need my advice. And the second thing was I said that by the time I could research it, get it in the book, and get it published, it would all be out of date because you know a lot of the the research of of my book I did in two uh, in 2015 and it got published in 2016. Um, so now, you know, so much has changed. Uh, but there's a friend of mine named Paul Rosenberg, and he has just released a new book. It's only 55 pages long. It's called The New Age of Intelligence. And uh, he sent me a copy of it, and I sat down and read it in one evening. And it absolutely, perfectly, uh, it could have been a chapter of my book. It could have fit right in that slot where I dodged the topic. It, it would, as a matter of fact, I might just, if I ever do a reprint, I might just steal it from Paul and put it right in there because it's, it's absolutely perfect. And I really want to encourage people that the paperback version is on Amazon and there's also a downloadable one there. And I, I can't remember what it costs, like a dollar or whatever, but it's, it's definitely worth downloading it and listen and listening to it, um, or reading it actually. It's, it's not on audio yet. It's on uh, PDF, I believe, hmm. but, uh, uh, Paul Rosenberg at Amazon, it's called The New Age of Intelligence. And if you like my book, really, I want to encourage you to grab that one. 
Very good, very good. And yeah, you know, I, I definitely understand why you, you kind of uh, avoided, you know, the, the crypto anarchism things, because uh, it is called the crypto wars. I mean, it's it's ongoing and, uh, you know, the, the, the market, you know, gets ahead. And uh, then, you know, the, the state catches up in a few years and then things have to be, you know, uh, you know changed and, and updated. So, yeah, I, I definitely understand why you kind of avoided that subject. And there's already plenty of material on that already. Uh, and so, so, yeah, I definitely, definitely understand that. And I, I, I need to check out that book because it sounds uh, sounds incredibly fascinating. Uh, it yeah. definitely does. So I want to hear your take on uh, uh, peaceful parenting as opposed to agorism. Yes, yes, definitely. So. I guess I guess first off, uh, uh, I, I'm curious. I, I want to kind of get get a feel for this first. Um, what made you like? What made you classify peaceful parenting as such? Now, uh, like, what what would you mind you know providing your reason reasoning and, and kind of walking us through that? Sure. Um, I kind of look at the relationship between a parent and a child very much like a a, a marketplace in the sense that um, the the parent is attempting to sell the child on certain beliefs and ideas. Uh, and the child is sort of like the customer. They can, they usually will buy what they're being sold, but some children don't buy it quite as well. And some parents have bad sales tactics. So uh, this is why very often you'll see some uh, some parent that is really, really radically religious in one particular, um, like like I hate to pick on any particular uh, uh, denomination, but there's a couple that are far more. Uh, likely in this tendency than other than some other denominations, but but you'll see this very often. The parent will be radically um, uh, that denomination and religious, and the child will grow up as an atheist because hey, they sampled that and they don't like it, and so they go the opposite direction. So that's a, a an example of really bad sales tactics by somebody who you know uh, is trying to push their ideas off on their child. So I kind of look at the the exchange between ideas and beliefs and behaviors that a parent is selling and uh, and the child as the uh, as the potential buyer who can either accept it or reject it, you know, in the long term. The, the, I think the sales tactics last the first 15 or 20 years and then the child at some point gets to the to a level where they decide, yeah, I'm buying this or, well, I'll take that and that, but I'm not taking that, you know. So that's my thoughts. Yeah, and I mean, I, I could definitely see it as you know, kind of like a, you kind of kind of viewing it as like a market interaction. But um, but but as far as agorism, I I just I just don't think so. So you know, as as all good philosophers do, let's let's kind of start with our our, our definitions here. Uh, so mm -hmm. agorism advocates the goal of bringing about a society in which all relations between people are voluntary exchanges by means of counter economics. Uh, now, counter economics, the sum of all non-aggressive human action, which is forbidden by the state. The counter economy includes the free market, the black market, the underground economy, all acts of civil and social disobedience, all acts of forbidden association, sexual, racial, cross-religious, and anything else the state at any place or time chooses to prohibit, control, regulate, tax, or tariff. The counter economy excludes all state-approved action, uh, the white market, and the red market, violence and theft not approved by the state. Uh, now, would you agree with those, those definitions? Your definition of agorism is closer to what everything I was saying in my book uh, agrees with, except the peaceful parenting part. So, so if we're going to use the the definition what you just said, which is a really really good definition for agorism, then you're right. Uh, parent uh, peaceful parenting would not apply to that because it's a it's directly it's it's action um, encouraging the market. Uh, um, in opposition to the state. So, um, yeah, pa peaceful parenting would not be in that category. It, in my mind, I was associating it more with Agora just being the marketplace. Um, and, and so I think maybe in my book, I, I, I sort of cross bred two, two thoughts there. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, it it does, it does. Yeah. So, because um, yeah, when I, working from, I, you know, working from those those kind of the, the, what what Conkin kind of laid out. Yeah, it's definitely not a peaceful parenting is definitely not agorism. But if you're going kind of a different direction with that, I mean, I, I certainly understand how you know uh, parenting can be like a, a market interaction. Um, but you know, as 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 far as like Conkin laid it out, uh, yeah, definitely not, <laughs> definitely not. I think the confusion. I wish I would have seen that before. Uh before I put it into print, I think part of the confusion there might also be because there are prominent, at least uh, former libertarians or former anarchists 
who have very strongly promoted uh, peaceful parenting as a way to kill the state. And uh, uh, I, I don't think it is. I'm, it, I, it's a method of grazing your children. But I, you know, um, and that's what I was trying to point out in the book as well, that I, I just don't see a mechanism of where peaceful parenting could ever have any serious impact on the state, if for no other reasons, uh, just numbers alone. I mean, there's so many billions of people and there's such a tiny amount of us that, uh, you know, that would even hear the message of using peaceful parenting to fight the state. I, I think the, the numbers alone um, just negate the possibility of that working. Yes, yes, and and last was it last year or twenty fifteen? I don't remember. All these these dates kind of run together now. Uh, but uh, but, but yeah, back uh, a couple of years ago, I was interviewing uh, Cal Molne on the subject of peaceful parenting, and I was not I was unfamiliar with it at that time. I kind of heard it. It was propagated all the time on you know anarchist circles. But so I I, I watched the uh, the entire playlist of the of that uh, one Canadian salesman, as you put it, uh, in your book. I spent oh god too many hours too many hours, and what one of the one of the kind of worries I have with peaceful parenting is that it kind of plays uh, right into you know right into the hands of the state, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of explain that here. But uh, uh, I, I'm not sure if you've watched some of the interviews that uh, the, this certain Can Canadian salesman uh, put out on this, but uh, but most of the guests were you know praising the anti-spanking laws. Uh, they were just, you know, so happy that uh, these countries, you know, banned spanking. Uh, mm -hmm. The parents could be, you know, tossed in jail or or they could, uh, you know, the, the children could be taken from the parents. Uh, so I guess one fear I have with peaceful parenting, if, if you know, the and this and unfortunately, I, I don't hear a lot of anarchists saying like we're against, you know, anti spanking laws. It's just kind of like we yeah, we think, you know, spanking is violence or whatever. Uh, so I, I mean, if if <laughs> uh, you know if if like an anti-spanking law gets passed or something, uh, and uh, you know it could further you know kind of destroy the family, because uh, it kind of plays uh, right into the state, right? Uh, you know, the destruction of the family and, and all that all that stuff. So I, I kind of see. Uh, I kind of, you know, kind of worry about that. And when I was talking to Cal Molina about it, I said, uh, and obviously you're against anti-spanking laws. And he said, yeah, of course. Well, I said, maybe you guys should like say that more so that, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, kind of separate yourself from from those statists who, who, would, who would like that sort of thing. Yeah, because the last thing a family needs is family services coming in and, you know, sticking their nose in and snatching the kids up and hauling them off to who knows where, mm -hmm. where they may or may not be abused, you know. Ugh. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 not good. It's not good. But uh, uh, but yeah, okay. Glad glad we we kind of got that out of the way because I like I, I was I was definitely confused as, as to why you you categorize you know peaceful parenting as agorism. But the, well, you, you you explained it and I, I understand now. Uh, so that's uh, that's definitely good. Um, now I want to say you know kind of the the one of a final note here on peaceful parenting. I, I I definitely appreciate you taking use of force issues in your book beyond uh beyond that. Uh, my wording here, you know, it may piss some folks off, but I kind of see, you know, peaceful parenting as being the safe space for use of force issues within the libertarian and anarchist community with hardly no one discussing things that we have on this podcast like uh, guerrilla warfare, just war theory, assassination politics, etc. Uh, yeah. So I, it's, it's <laughs> you know, that there's no way in hell that the state's going to wither away voluntarily, you know, through education alone. It's just not going to happen. Uh, right. it's, it's important, but it's not the uh, the be all and end all. Uh, so I I, <laughs> I don't know. Like we, we've discussed those subjects, and and you know they've they've kind of been controversial, and most people don't like uh, they don't like you know talking about uh, you know uh, sometime in the future killing government agents. It's just not a subject that uh, that they like to think about. Uh, most folks. Uh, so I guess why like could, could you speak to that? I mean, why why do you find you know like especially like part two, part two and three of your book? Why do you find these subjects which are violent in nature? I mean, worth discussing. <laughs> I think, you know, I had wanted early on for, for many years, I had just wanted to believe that the state would eventually fade and that we would be able to reduce it and, you know, break it up a little at a time. And, but I can blame a lot of this on my daughter, uh, Kai. She, we would have long discussions and um, she would just use the Socratic method, not necessarily to prove me wrong or uh, she, she would, she would uh, question me even on things she agreed with because she was first off helping me relearn how to think after I had a really bad concussion. But also she was uh, refining her own skills with using the Socratic method and wanting to uh, help me to be able to really analyze what it was I believed and why I believed it. And in, as we went through this hour after hour, you know, just sitting around the house talking, I realized that the state, like you just got through saying, the state is not going to wither. It's not going to let us 
um, you know, slowly voted into tiny little secessionist groups and then vote that into something smaller and vote. It's not going to do that. The people, like I say in the book, the people who are making incredible amounts of money by the state and its aggression and, and its wars and everything, those people are not just going to go, oh, you didn't want us to rule you. OK, you can go now. You know, they're not going to do that. They will annihilate cities. They will, you know, they will wipe out anything they need to do. They will kill each other. They will, you know, they, they don't care what they do. They will stay in power until mm -hmm. someone removes them. I hate to say physically removes them because that, <laughs> that has other connotations, right? <laughs> it does. But but somebody will have to. And and we, they've already proven you know, uh, if you just look at all the bombed out cities and you look at the way they behave and the way SWAT teams behave, and they've already proven that they will, they have, and they're going to use horribly violent methods to keep us in control. And so essentially they've already forfeited their property rights and including their right to live. Because when you kill people or when you order people to kill people, you have forfeited your right to your own life. So once I came to that conclusion, it was just a matter of figuring out strategy, like how do we do this and not just have them drone us all and, and we're all dead. And so I have to blame Bill uh, Bupert for a lot of this. Hours of sitting with Bill, um, you know, at Porkfest where we just sat together at the campground uh, or, or in our uh, RV um, or phone calls or podcasts that we did together, but just hours and hours of, uh, oh, and I might also add, uh, I was privileged to be on a series of emails between uh, Bill Bupert and another really, really good military tactician. Mm. And they were kind enough to just attach me to it and keep me in the conversation, even though I wasn't adding anything to it. So I could just watch this back and forth. Like, you know, how would, how would you handle this under the zero aggression principle? How would you handle that? How would you arm these people? How would you, you know, and, and it was really helpful. And then uh, the, I think the next catalyst was when we went to Missouri, uh, I had to go there for a wedding to uh, officiate a wedding. And while I was there, I got to talk to some um, militia types and some really hardcore bikers. Hmm. And they're probably not going to stick with the zero aggression principle. But their methods of organizing and their plan, this was right at the time when what was going on in um, uh, Ferguson was happening. I mean, like the days that I was on people's farms talking to them about these things, the riots were happening in Ferguson that same day. So, so it was really fresh in their minds of this clash that's coming between citizens and government and, you know, and, uh, and so I got to really hear what their plans were if, and they, a lot of them thought that the Ferguson thing was going to be an excuse to come out and get the militias mm. because there were. Uh, specific incidences where some of the violence against some of the residents of Ferguson were blamed on militias. And so they were thoroughly convinced that the government was going to use Ferguson as an excuse to come to go out into the countryside in Missouri and start grabbing the, uh, the militias. And they were prepared for it. They were not prepared to stand up and go to a face to face battle. They were prepared to just blend into the mountains and uh, fight a war like, um, Oh, bloody Bill Anderson and uh, that that type of a war. They they were actively planning it, you know, a, a full out. Um, um, what do you call that? Guerrilla warfare. Wow. So I thought, man, I got to learn as much as I can from these people. So we spent, uh, oh, I don't know, four or five, six. I can't remember now, maybe six months in Missouri. And I ch ch talked to every one of them that, that would let me talk to them and pick their brains and find out what their methods would be and you know uh and then i and i tried to refine it all down and and bring it into something that was um you know that was useful for us but that's i don't know if i got to the quest to the answer of the question or not but but that was kind of the method of where i how i got to where i went to yeah um but uh but yeah i i think that that's, that's definitely fascinating i mean you actually went out and did you know the the on the on the ground uh you know investig investigating uh so to speak which is uh uh which is which is definitely interesting and i i i 
I don't know. And yeah, and as, as I mentioned, as part of the direct action series, we did talk about, you know, guerrilla warfare and just war theory and assassination politics. And, you know, I think assassination politics looks, uh, looks most promising. I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Jim Bell's uh, um, uh, proposition uh, of that. Um, but uh, I think that one could be could be very, very useful. So I guess let me let me just kind of I, I want to go into that a little bit more. Why do you find these uh, these subjects important to to discuss? I think at some point in time we're going to face uh, a situation where we won't have a choice. We're going to, you know, imagine yourself in um, Watertown, Massachusetts, when uh, when that kid from the the Boston bombing thing, the mar marathon bombing. Imagine yourself being a resident there and having you know, not just a SWAT team, but essentially an army coming down the street going house to house. Um, and that was over one kid that was suspected of a crime. And I know it's a horrific crime. Oh, hold on. My dog's having a little problem here. He has COPD and sometimes he can't breathe. Anyway, um, so, you know, imagine yourself in that kind of a situation. There's nothing you can do. You can't resist uh, an army's coming down the street going house to house. You might think you're the, the biggest, bravest Rambo that's ever lived. You don't have a chance against those people. You will, you will submit. There's, you will submit or you will die. There's no third choice, you know. Um, and at some point, I mean, that, that is just a, uh, that's just testing the waters. They were just seeing how things go. They've had, we've had horrible crimes committed before and we didn't have, you know, a, a, an entire town invaded like that. So this was just testing the water. What what will people do? How will they handle it? Well, the way they handled it in Boston, in, in Watertown, was the only way they could at the time. But what if we were organized differently? What if a group like that started coming down the streets? And what if we had snipers sitting back at a distance and we were taking out just the leaders? Or when the when the um, when the mayor and the uh, the state uh, or the governor or who or whoever those people were the the uh, top sheriff or whoever got up there and made their little announcements. What if live on CNN, one of them gets taken out? Oh yeah, yeah. What would that do? You know, how would that shake up people's confidence in the state? If the state can't even protect their own on live TV, what can they really protect? Now can they protect us? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, that's the kind of things that that, uh, that I think about. And I think we, we have to start thinking in that realm now and start preparing for it and learning the techniques. Otherwise, we're going to be like Watertown and we're going to be sitting there. It's going to be too late. We won't have anything that we can do about it. All we can do is let it happen and watch it happen to our families. Watch it happen. You know, you think of the TSA and what they do at the airport routinely now. Um, how is it that we allowed that to get to that point? I mean, how it, you, I said this often, my grandfather, uh, was a very peaceful man. He was deacon in a Baptist church in Eastern Kentucky. I don't think he ever got in a fist fight in his life. Um, but he did carry a pistol his whole life in his pocket and he carried it because he went for walks all the time in the mountains in Appalachia. And so you see snakes, and, and uh, for him, uh, snapping turtles were always a target because he hated snapping turtles because they ate fish, and he liked to fish. <laughs> so my grandfather always carried a pistol in his pocket. Now, I think, you know, what would my grandfather have done, have, what, what would he have done had a TSA agent started feeling up my grandmother? He would have shot him right on the spot. He wouldn't have hesitated. Even though he's a very peaceful man, very religious, never violent in his whole life, if he would have looked up and saw a TSA agent, gr you know, groping my grandmother, he would have popped that guy right on the spot, wouldn't even have hesitated. But we can't now. If you try that now, you would not leave the airport alive. So, so we have to prepare before we get in a situation where we can't do anything about it. Yeah, and it's better to have have, have those uh, means of self defense and not need them than than need them and not have them. Uh, yeah. So, and, and that's why, like, when we've talked about these subjects, I mean, obviously, it's theoretical and is covered by Brandenburg v. Ohio. Uh, you know, since uh, no no direct targeting and uh, no incitement. Um, but uh, but you know, like, just you know, even theoretically, just discussing the, these things is is important and, and getting people into that mindset that okay, you understand that you know the the state likes to lash out, they like to to murder and and murder and uh, steal and all that all that stuff that that we're both both aware of.
um, you may need to do this at some time. So just kind of get, get in the mindset now uh, and, and just, you know, consider this as, you know, a possibility in, in the future. Uh, so even just getting people in that mindset, even if it's purely theoretical and not really, you know, applicable to, you know, certain situations, uh, I think that's probably the biggest hurdle is, you know, with, with libertarians and anarchists is, is trying to get, uh, get you know, folks beyond peaceful parenting and get them actually thinking about, you know, uh, you know, use like further use of force issues. Uh, because I think that's going to be, you know, I, I think the, the, the strategies and tactics, I think that would, that would obviously be, take some, some work. But uh, I think the, the biggest hurdle is going to be, you know, getting people in that mindset. It's going to be tough. Very much so. Um, one of the things I've been watching lately, and I think I mentioned a little bit in the book, but one of the things I've been watching lately are these um, pro-Trump pro and anti-Trump rallies that are taking place. And I have no interest in that either way. You know, one one horrible person with the title of president or a different horrible person with the title of president it just doesn't matter to me in the least. However, um, when they, not long ago, a couple of days ago, I saw the headline that there was a pro-Trump rally and that a group of black bloc um, actually disrupted it to the point of where they ended the rally. Ah. And as soon as I saw that, I thought, we ought to be there selling them T-shirts, you know, <laughs> or or we should be on the roof spotting the, the police movements and radio, radioing that down to people on the ground that can tell both sides where the police are moving and, and what's going on. Because I don't care whether the whether they're for Trump or whether they're against Trump. If I can sell them a T-shirt and make money off of them, hey, that's great. If I can sell them one of their stupid little ball caps and make money off of it, man, <laughs> I, you know, sell them ball caps. Um, it's kind of like the Che the Che shirts, you know. Yeah. yeah. Like, the, the irony of selling a Che shirt just it cracks me up. <laughs> but. But we, but we could be doing that, and that would like at least it would be doing something. At least it would be training us for, you know, how to spot the police, how to watch them from the roof and not get snipered by another cop, you know, how to set up surveillance without getting spotted. I, I'm just saying the same thing a different way, without getting spotted by a, a sniper team and having them target you just because you're up there with a camera, you know, or or binoculars. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned something interesting there about the about the black block. And the, it used to be on the Freedom Umbrella of Direct Action, but uh, then we took it off, uh, you know, because, you know, the, the connotations with the, with the syndicalists and the commies. Um, but but I do think, uh, um, you know, since you're talking about the black block, I think, um, you know, there, there could be a, you know, a propertarian anarchist approach to, to that where it could be used as a distraction. Like if there's an operation going on, like if it's a prison break or whatever, whatever the hell it is, uh, mm -hmm. use your imagination. Uh, and, uh, you know, something like that's going on. I mean, black block would be a great way to, you know, distract because you know, they love sending, you know, what uh, their entire police force, uh, sometimes the National Guard, et cetera, et cetera, out to those locations. So as far as and the mainstream media focuses on it, too. So if uh, it could serve as a very, very good distraction, um, you know, uh, as long as, you know, no private property is damaged. But, uh, you know, right. uh, yeah. I think I think it could be a, a useful tactic, but it's not on the freedom, freedom umbrella of direct action anymore, just because uh, it's not used in that way. <laughs> it hasn't yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, I And I want to emphasize, you know, I mentioned this in the book that. Uh, in my way of thinking, it would be perfectly fine to hang out with some of those people and infiltrate their organizations, not so much to change their minds or and certainly not to get involved in activity that's going to get you beat up or shot or, you know, breaking somebody's windows or something like that. But just to sort of open channels of communication with them and so that we can coordinate things with them if they want to go and and break people's you know destroy people's property and stuff well we're not going to stop them and we shouldn't even try to stop them you know let let the market fix that through whatever means that it takes if that means you know shop owners on the roof with their own rifles or uh you know whatever it takes to stop them that's fine but if we can um work with both sides left and right and coordinate uh, with them without letting them infiltrate us. And so infiltrate them without letting them infiltrate us. And I think this was a big mistake that Murray Rothbard made, maybe his biggest mistake. At, you know, at one point he was reaching out to the left and then he decided that was a bad idea and he started reaching out to the right. 
And then, you know, he died before he could realize what a horrible idea that was. And now we've, we're suffering the consequences that, of that as, you know, a, a, a large group of so-called uh, libertarians and anarchists just got siphoned off uh, uh-huh. into the alt-right. And you just stand and shake your head. And some of them were obvious. It's like, yeah, that guy was, of course, he went over there. But others, it's just like, dude, how can you be fooled like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's interesting too. And I was watching. Uh, it was a uh, uh, not not. I don't like Jeffrey Tucker on on all things, but uh, but he he uh, didn't, uh, he was interviewed by Derek Bros a, a couple weeks ago, and uh, he had an interesting kind of theory about that. Uh, like the the so like the the Ron Paul campaigns. I mean, obviously it was like a big camp. It appealed to the left and it appealed to the right. And uh, you know, as uh, um, there was no really you know firm ethical or or you know uh, principled stance. It was just kind of you know appealing to to a wide number of folks. And now that uh, uh, you know the you know, the this, this most recent election cycle, uh, we're, we're kind of seeing, you know, uh, some of those folks who, who were, you know, whether they were closet authoritarians or whether they were just not really serious about libertarianism, if they were just, you know, uh, clinging on to that name until something better came along. Um, kind of, so that's it's kind of an interesting thing he kind of posited as far as like, uh, you know, it might be the result of the, of the Ron Paul campaign. Um, but, uh, uh, but very, very good. I want to move on to, uh, uh, well, actually, was there anything else you want to mention in regards to that? Uh, actually, I think I can tie. You you were going to move to uh, freedom bed and breakfast. Uh, one I have one other one other thing here I want to mention uh, about your about your book, and then we'll move on to that. Oh, okay. Um, well, go ahead. And when when you when we start to talk about freedom bed and breakfast, I'll I'll tie the book and and that together. Uh, I'll have a little thought there. Okay. Very good. Very good. Uh, well, I I I, I want to say that I, I really appreciate your stance on secession. Uh, in July of, of last year, I put out a, a broadcast titled An Anarchist Against Secession. And, uh, you know, at that point, I, I really wasn't aware of, uh, of any other anarchist who held a similar position. Like, it, it just kind of the default position, it seems, is, uh, you know, secession is, is good uh, in anarchist circles. I mean, it's promoted a lot. Uh, but, I mean, yeah, it, it requires the political means. Uh, that, and unfortunately, some folks who are wholly apolitical, you know, would compromise uh, and get involved in politics again if it came to secession. So I don't think that's good uh, at all. And you kind of mentioned this in your book, but it's it's unlikely as all hell. I mean, they're, they're not just going to, you know, relinquish power into smaller states. And, you know, uh, the amendment for secession would have to start in the legislature. So this isn't something you can pick up and do yourself <laughs> tomorrow. You've got to, you got a grassroots lobby, you got to run for political office, you got to get your guys in the legislature, and then, then at that point, you can get that on, you can get that, uh, you, you can get that voted on. But uh, uh, it'd be a long process. It would, you know, it'd be a waste of time. I mean, politics is a waste of time. You'd have to spend a lot of, a lot of work and, and money and effort to get those people in, just to even get the damn thing on the ballot. Right. Uh, so it, it's it's just it's, it's so naive and 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 the fact that most like a, a lot of folks you know just are you know kind of just default in favor of it. Uh, I I it's 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 not good. It's not good. <laughs> it's a giant energy suck. You know, it just pulls uh, intellectual uh, and, and financial resources away into something that can never that can never be done. It's like I well I compare it to. Uh, uh, um, Oh boy, I lost the word. Turning turning lead into into uh, gold, alchemy. Oh. I compare it to alchemy because that's what it is. It's something that you, you know there are people that just commit their whole lives to it, and they never have any progress. But right to the last minute, they're convinced it's the way to go. Yeah, yeah, it's almost as bad as state nullification. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah. Okay, very good. So let's uh, let's uh, let's uh, move on to you know freedom of freedom bed and breakfast, which I'm really really excited about. Uh, uh, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and uh, you know with with all of the there's there's a lot of decentralized and you know open source uh, uh, open source technology that's being released, and uh, you know I, I think I think that's kind of the direction things are going. You know decent like just decentralized peer to peer relationships, uh, uh, and I think we're kind of seeing the, the trend go in that direction, uh, and. Uh, and also, you know, with freedom bed and breakfast. I mean, that's uh, that's what your guys' goal is. Uh, um, but you said you had a, a point you wanted to uh, connect that uh, to your book. Yeah, um, a few years ago, uh, I think I put it in several podcasts a few years ago. The the need that we have to be able to, let's say you have someone, and I'll just use uh, I'll use New Hampshire as an, as an example because it's way on the east side of the of the United States. Let's say you have someone in New Hampshire, and you know that person is being targeted big time by the cops. You know that maybe federal authorities or somebody is coming after him 
probably in the next 24 hours. They have already, you know, shown their hand and, and he, I mean, very often times when, when these things happen, sometimes it all happens smoothly and there's just a trial and everything goes fine. But other times strange things happen and the guy's in the back of the police van and somehow he falls and, you know, breaks his neck. And by the time they get to the police station, oh, look, he seems to have died. Mm -hmm. Or they've got a guy handcuffed in the back seat of a police car who's already been searched twice. And then somehow he pulls out a gun with his hands handcuffed behind his back and shoots himself in the back of the head with a caliber of gun that exactly matches the cop. Oh, how in the world did that happen? Crazy. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, other times, you know, a reporter is sitting in his office, in his uh, home office, and his children are in the other part of the house, and he decides uh, for some odd particular reason, whatever it is, we don't know his mind, to shoot himself twice in the back of the head. That's clearly a suicide, you know. So um, especially since he's investigating the CIA at the time. But so we have, so in our theoretical thing, we have this guy, let's just say in New Hampshire, let's call him for lack of a better name. Let's call him Shane. So Shane's in New Hampshire and the word comes out, Hey, uh, they might be coming out to, to pick him up. So, uh, so he hits a network on his phone. He, he pulls an app up and now he's instantly got a network on his phone of places that he can go and stay without his credit card you know, popping up on, on uh, you know, Motel 6 or whoever uh, all across the United States. Now he can go from one place to another completely undocumented and he can stay. Maybe he uses Bitcoin. Maybe he uses bullion. Maybe he uses, you know, pretty colored rocks, whatever. It doesn't matter. As long as the person who is hosting him, maybe they'll do it for free. You know, let them figure that out on their own. That's not that's not anybody's business, but theirs anyway. That's a private exchange. Mm hmm. But now, if he's got a way that he can go night by night and hop all the way across, and let's say we can get him to, um, let's say we can get him to Phoenix, where he can stay uh, safely in Phoenix for a few weeks until we can get him further south, and then he can cross over the border, and then we can move him into a safe country where he can live peaceably the rest of his life and not be harassed. And maybe we've got somebody in Mexico who can like set up false identification for him, and now you know, so he can go and do whatever he wants to do, uh, maybe in Central America or somewhere or wherever he can settle. Mm -hmm. Now, if we had a way to do that and move somebody across, you know, all the way across the country without leaving a, a trail of crumbs as uh, everywhere he went, that'd be really handy, uh, you know, for activists. So that was one of the things I was thinking about with this. So that's kind of what you can do. That's the most radical end maybe of, uh, of things you can do with this app that we're building. But essentially, um, like Airbnb is a, a popular app that allows travelers to connect with, uh, with hosts and sometimes just to hop from one location to another to get somewhere, but sometimes as a destination. So you, if you have like a, a spare room at your house that you would like to rent out to someone and the town that you're in has some kind of tourist activities, let's say you live in uh, uh, Orlando. Well, then rather than somebody spending $100 or $150 a night at one of Disney's hotels, you can just list your house, your room on Airbnb and list all the activities that are nearby your home so that then someone can say, hey, look at this. I can go and stay there for $40 a night, have breakfast and still go to, you know, to whatever the attractions are every day. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. that's the wonders of Airbnb. But the bad point about Airbnb is Airbnb makes the not only do they make the connection between the traveler and the host, they charge the traveler and then they pay the host. So they have a, a solid record of all the travel that the traveler has made, where locations that he stopped and how much he's paid along the way and how much each one of those hosts have collected. And it all has to be done with Federal Reserve notes. Uh -huh. So to me, all those things are negative. Um, so that was our idea originally with Freedom Bed and Breakfast was to just have an app to where you could safely and securely allow two people to connect and they can then privately negotiate whatever they want to negotiate. And, uh, and we don't know anything about it because they're, they're no longer on our part of the, and we don't, we don't even make a, a first record of this connection. 
So if there is a subpoena type situation, there literally exists nothing to subpoena. We don't uh, have a record of it. And then our other thought was to host it offshore to, again, further the, the safety of it so that it's as, as safe as possible uh, with the primary uh, website being an offshore host. And we're working on all those things. We haven't accomplished any of them yet because this is brand new. We, we ha we're not even completely sold on the name Freedom Bed and Breakfast. We're kicking around other things. I've had some people ask me, so, Ben, so you're opening a bed and breakfast in Ohio? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> but so we're kicking around some other – before we get too big on this, we're kicking around some other ideas like lodging for liberty and hobo, hobos and habitats and hobos and ho hosts. Uh, rooms for freedom, room to roam. We're just we're kicking around different names, um, so we'll we'll likely stay with feed, freedom bed and breakfast. But we're also kind of open to whatever the market wants as a name for it, and whatever the market wants to pay uh, uh, for this service. So none of our prices are set in stone at this point. The only the biggest thing we're concerned about right now is getting the app written in using uh, you know, encryption and making sure that it is solidly encrypted. We have two really good uh, um, uh, computer guys. We have Dan, Sullivan's, Dan Sullivan that's actually doing the coding. And then we have Derek Slopey that's gonna come back and run back through it and test it and make sure everything's solid. And these are both really good computer guys. So, uh, so that's our focus right now is to get the software um, absolutely as good as it can possibly be built and as secure as it can be built. And uh, uh, we've, we've put less emphasis on things like advertising and, you know, what kind of branding and logos and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very good. So you, so you mentioned, you mentioned encryption. I, I imagine uh, kind of, you know, the uh, following that uh, if there's, uh, I'm sure there's gonna be communication between, you know, hosts and um, hosts and, you know, guests. Uh, obviously I'm, I'm guessing the, the communication between them will be, will be encrypted with some sort of protocol, right? Yeah. Um, so let me kind of describe what, what the user will see. So if you're the traveler uh, and you have the app on your phone and, uh, and you – let's say there, there's, let's say there's two different ways to do this. You could have like a yearly membership that would be, uh, that would be a much cheaper way of doing it or well, let's say you only travel once or twice a year and so it's not worth it to have a, you know, a whole year paid for. So, so one month you know you're going to travel so you just get a one-month uh, – um, uh, membership, let's say. Mm -hmm. It's probably not the good wording, but so you get a one month uh, agreement and you uh, fill out a basic profile and you uh, load that to, to Freedom BNB and that's all encrypted and it's, and it's secure. And then when you decide that you want to uh, travel, then you enter into your app. You know, I'm traveling on these days. This is when I expect to be in this town. This is when I expect to be in this city. And this is when I expect to leave. And then you launch that in the app. The app then goes and looks at uh, the profiles of hosts that fit the city or the town that you're going to in that time frame. And if it finds, let's say it finds five possible hosts. So it notifies them, hey, you've got a possible host or you've got a possible traveler. Would you like to see his profile? So then for the first time, people will be able to see your profile uh, so that they can decide whether or not they want you in their house. Mm -hmm. And your profile will also have a rating with it. So if you've stayed at other places, then other places could rate you as a, as a traveler. How good was he? Did he pay? Did he, you know, uh, did he get drunk and vomit all over the carpet, whatever? So, um, and if it's your first time traveling, then it'll say first time traveler, first time user. Um, and then the host would be uh, uh, able to say, you know, yes, I, that, that's good. We want him. Here's, uh, and then communicate back with him that, yes, we are, you know, we're basically making an offer to you of staying at our, at our place. And then the two of you could work out, uh, if you chose, if the traveler chose to accept the host, the two of you could work out the, uh, the payment arrangements. But let's say you've got five possible hosts. One of them looks at it and says, yeah, you know, I don't think that guy is really my, I don't want him here. And so he rejects it. Well, the traveler doesn't even know that that person rejected him. There's no feedback loop there uh, at all because the, the, the exchange was rejected by one of the parties. But let's say four of those possible hosts 
answer back to the traveler. And he looks at him and he's like, well, this first one, I, uh, I don't want to stay there. I'm looking at the pictures of the room. They have a bad rating and he just deletes that one. Well, the, the host never sees why the rejection took place. There's no communication on that. Um, and then he decides, the traveler decides, uh, yeah, this one's close to the airport. That's the one I want. And so he takes it. Mm-hmm. Then the two communicate and they figure out how they, how they want to exchange this. Uh, how, you know, how they want to make their exchange. And it might be, it might not even be money. It might be, hey, you know, I'm a good carpenter and I plan to be there for three months and do you have a place and I can fix your roof, you know, or something like that. Who knows? Mm-hmm. It, can, it could be anything. Oh, and one other thing, <laughs> I don't mean to be totally dominating. No, the you're, you're, you're all right. Yeah keep, yeah. keep talking. Keep talking. Good stuff. So, so we have the possibility of a problem coming into this. What if the traveler wants to pay, let's say, in Bitcoin, but the host, maybe they're not into Bitcoin or maybe, you know, um, maybe they just really like silver. Well, the traveler, maybe he doesn't want to carry two weeks worth of, you know, of, of silver in his pocket to pay, you know, one or two ounces a night to stay someplace. Maybe he doesn't want to carry around 14 or, or 28, you know, ounces of silver with him in his pockets. Mm-hmm. So, um, so we have a solution for that. Roberts and Roberts Brokerage, it, we're working with them to also build an app so that in this situation, they have a separate app and the traveler would open that app. And, and once the agreement was made on what, on what it would cost to stay at the, at the host's um, facility, then the, uh, then the traveler could just open the Roberts and Roberts app and say, I want to pay this much in Bitcoin and they want to receive it in, let's say, silver. And so the host would then open their Roberts and Roberts app and give the, the, you know, uh, uh, the authorization for the transaction. And then they could have it set up with Roberts and Roberts where uh, Roberts and Roberts mailed them the silver, like either when it happens or maybe like once every three months or once every six months or once a year, Roberts and Roberts would then send you your, you know, clear out your account. Or it could be the other way around. Or it could be maybe the traveler wants to pay with Federal Reserve notes, and the but the host doesn't want those things. So it could still go through Roberts and Roberts app. So now we've created a way to exchange almost anything for almost anything. Um, and again, uh, Freedom Bed and Breakfast wouldn't have anything to do with that exchange. We wouldn't even know that it took place because it's a totally separate app. Very good, very good, and I, and I, I assume like uh, uh, I assume like if the if the host wants uh, wants Bitcoin and the the uh, guest has has uh, you know FRNs, uh, they could send the FR, FRNs to Roberts and Roberts, and Roberts and Roberts would send the host Bitcoin. I imagine. Cor- correct. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, giving give yeah providing a you know a lot of flexibility and a lot of freedom to you know um, you know accept whatever the hell you want to accept. Very good, very good. So so I guess as far as you you know uh, you're you're still still a lot of work to do. But uh, do you have any idea when this thing is uh, set for launch? We are going to be looking at a prototype on the 7th of next month, uh, April, April 7th. Um, we have a prototype that the, uh, that, uh, Dan's going to be showing us and demonstrating, you know, what he's got with it. And at that point, Dan is going to be giving a, a large block of the, um, uh, of the coding over to Derek and Derek's going to start sorting through it and looking, you know, uh, looking through it all, making sure that it's all written well and encrypted well and all that kind of thing. So we're that close to having, I wouldn't say a, um, it, it won't be a publicly available beta version yet, but it will be to the point of where we, we begin our testing on the 7th. Awesome. Very good. So it's, it's moving quickly, moving quickly. That's uh, that's that's very, very good. Uh, now, I recently did a, an episode on something called Libre Taxi, which, you know, uh, uh, is the decentralized version of Uber and Lyft. Uh, so again, you know, drivers connected to the passengers without the middlemen, uh, which I think this would be kind of uh, kind of neat too. I mean, some, I suppose someone you know could take Libre Taxi to their Freedom and Bed, Freedom Bed and Breakfast host. So you just have yeah. decentralization to the max, which which is uh, which is which would be pretty incredible. Yeah, I listened to that episode. I was, that was fascinating. I, I it was like when, as I was listening to that, I was thinking, man, this is exactly like you know it 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 runs parallel with what we're doing. This is great. These are two things that could be used in conjunction. One is getting your transportation taken care of, and the other is taking your your lodging taken care of. So this is great. I mean, it's perfect uh, uh, hand in hand. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, so so who do you guys have on the team? Uh, who who are you working with? 
Okay, so uh, me, I'm the spokes model. I, uh, I said before, I'm the Vanna White of the group. Um, and then we have Jim Davidson. Jim takes care. Of, he's he's Jim's expertise is in education, mining, real estate development, and business development. So he's taking care of the business end of it, putting it together, and uh, and basically building the business end of it. Then we have Dan Sullivan and Derek Slopey that I talked about as our coding geniuses and computer whizzes. And then we have uh, J- um, Jeremy Hen- Hen- Hengler. Hengler. Yeah, I always have a tro- I just, I hope he is not offended. I always just call him Heisenberg. But uh, uh, we have Jeremy as our consult, as our consultation and for testing. Um, he picks apart our, our ideas and uh, gives suggestions and looks for mistakes in, in what we're doing and, and really helps us out in that kind of thing. Then we have Jeremiah Harding. And he is our uh, social media guru. He's telling us how to adjust our public uh, appearance and you know how, how to how to communicate with through social media and get the the message out that way. And then we have a graphic artist that I'm probably going to mispronounce his name because I didn't realize until the beginning of the show today that I've never actually heard his name pronounced. I've only read it. Uh, his name is John. I believe it's John Loth. Yeah, it's probably Loth, okay. L-O-T-H-E, John Loth. Um, anyway, so he's our graphic artist, and he's working on a bunch of stuff for us to to start introducing the, you know, like uh, YouTube uh, uh, videos and uh, better logos and some some better advertising. And we're also trying to communicate with a um, uh, someone in the musical area to get us a jingle put together. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to take care of that. So that's that's pretty much our team. We've got a couple silent partners that we can fall back on uh, for some specialty items. But uh, right now our biggest emphasis is getting the coding all done and the app actually you know working. Very good. Sounds like uh, sounds like a uh, sounds like a great team. And uh, yeah, it looks like things are are, are moving forward. Uh, uh, looking forward to uh, you know. Uh, being able to use this at some point because uh, it's definitely uh, it's definitely necessary. And uh, as far as uh, you know, just just travel, you know, and be convenient to go stay with uh, stay with you know uh, you know fellow freedom lover. Uh, but also, you know, uh, uh, the impact this could have uh, the kind of like the example that she mentioned uh, at the beginning. Uh, you know, it could be a, a great like a great way to you know house uh, uh, underground activists uh, or if uh, someone's on the run. I mean, it, this this could have some some very very positive implications. Um, excuse me. The the one thing I didn't mention was that it doesn't have to actually be a room in your house. Let's say uh, some people might just offer, you know, a couch uh, or maybe they have a nice camping spot in their back where a person can throw a tent. And that might be really appealing to somebody. Let's say they're on the Appalachian Trail and they find out that with, you know, a short five minute walk off the trail and they've got a nice safe place to, to put a tent or whatever. Or maybe it's, uh, you know, maybe you've got a farm and you might have a, a spot where some RVs could park. Well, if you're in your RV and you're going across country and you really don't want to spend, you know, 50 to to $100 a night at a campground, you, maybe some farmer would give you a really good deal. And maybe he's even got a 220 plug-in that uh, you could plug your RV into. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, so they could use the same thing. It wouldn't have to be a bed and breakfast. It, 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 it wouldn't have to be a room. It could be pretty much anything your imagination, uh, any spot you have available. Hey, I have a good driveway. If somebody wants to park in my driveway overnight, then they can do that. I don't have room in my house, but you can park in my driveway for free. You know, mm-hmm. the free service I'm offering. Or, you know, uh, give me a tip before you leave. Uh, you can park in my driveway, we'll serve you breakfast, and you can give me whatever tip you feel like. It could go in directions like that just as easy. Awesome. Very good. Very good. Yeah, the, the possibilities are endless. Uh, they, they definitely are. They definitely are. So uh, uh, any any other, anything else uh, you want to mention on Freedom Bed and Breakfast? Is there a website uh, uh, people can go to? Uh, 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 anything else you want to plug on that? Yeah, a website would probably be handy, huh? <laughs> um, I can uh, uh, email you the uh, Indiegogo link. Um, one easy one to remember is hobosymbols.com, H-O-B-O-S-Y-M-B-O-L-S.com. Um, that's, uh, that's one of the landing spots that we have right now because we already, we already had that spot. 
And the hobo idea of moving around seems to be really attractive. So we, we see this connection between the two. So hobosymbols.com will get you there. And I'll send you the link for the uh, uh, Indiegogo campaign where we really like to, we're paying our uh, Dan, our programmer, full time to do this. And we would really like to be able to not pocket that entire uh, amount out of out of our own pockets. Yeah. So we're hoping to that the Indiegogo campaign will produce enough that we can have some working capital to keep the thing going and to keep Dan, you know, in pork and beans and and uh, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, um, energy drinks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll certainly put those in the show notes. And I, and I, I uh, uh, definitely recommend folks, uh, you know, so, so support uh, support something like this because decentralization, uh, you know, it's uh, it's definitely important, and that's kind of the direction things are going. And uh, uh, and you know, privacy as well. Privacy as well. So uh, I want to. I've got a couple. Uh, if, if there's uh, nothing else, I've got just a couple of more, you know, broad questions uh, that uh, that I'd like to, you know, get your thoughts on. Uh, sure. Good? Okay. Cool. Yeah. Go for it. So uh, the main focus of this podcast. Is, is direct action. I mean, we put out the Freedom Umbrella of Direct Action and the Direct Action series, uh, you know, finding freedom now without asking for permission. Uh, so, so I'm just curious of, of, of your thoughts. I mean, what, what forms of direct action do you view as being the most efficacious uh, in bringing about personal freedom? You know, anything you can do to not uh, pay taxes means you have a little bit of extra money. And I'm not saying, you know, uh, put yourself at risk of being arrested by the IRS and having everything you own taken away. But anything you can do to to leave less of a tax footprint so that you can use that money, um, you know, in your personal life to raise your children or to, you know, have a better life in general or to support some liberty cause or whatever. Every penny that you can not pay in taxes is penny is a penny you can use in a much better way. So, you know, pretty much anything. I'm I'm a big supporter of agorism for that reason. Same as you were talking about earlier uh, in the show. Um, I'm really strong on that kind of thing. Um, you know, uh, a, a little thing uh, is uh, unregistering to vote, like uh, like you helped me do. Mm -hmm. That's that's an important thing, I think. If nothing else, just for your own satisfaction, to say, yeah, I took this step. This is something I did, and then little steps like that encourage you to take bigger steps. So you know, pretty much anything that a person can do. Uh, uh, it is is positive as long as you're moving away from dependency on the state and moving no, more towards dependency on yourself. Indeed, yes, yes. You know, strategic withdrawal and, and, and cutting ties to the state. Uh, it's def definitely a good starting point. It's one of the first things that I that I, I recommend uh, after political field trips, which uh, topic for another time. But uh, uh, very good, very good. I'm definitely a big fan of uh, of, of uh, uh, agorism, um, and uh, you know, obviously those are. The, I, I definitely recommend canceling the voter registration as well. I guess uh, just uh, uh, one other question here. I mean. Uh, um, I, I guess what role do you see uh, crypto anarchism playing in, uh, you know, bringing about the end of the state uh, or, you know, expanding personal freedom? So this would be like encryption, cryptocurrencies, etc. I think it's critical. I think we just can't do it without the without people doing that uh, activity without it. And I'm not saying that we have to have Bitcoin. Bitcoin may or may not even succeed through its current uh, uh, problems that it's having. Mm -hmm. But cryptocurrencies in general, um, and and in, in a sense, like maybe even the more of them, the better. Uh, as long as we can figure out a way to exchange them between each other, then, you know, the market will, will fix those problems as they arise. But uh, as far as like hackers and hacktivism, hackers and hacktivism um, and uh, using crypt, uh, 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 encryption and emails. Um, there are people that I use encryption with in emails every time, no matter what it is I'm talking to them about. We could be, yeah, you just, because, hey, the more of that can, can get out there, the more resources it takes from the state to try to deal with those things. And that's great. You know, bleed, bleed the state with a million tiny little cuts, not because you want to bleed the state to death, but be just because it feels good to slice it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, big, yeah, big fan of encryption uh, uh, as well. Uh, I guess any, any overall closing thoughts? Um, you know, if you go over to uh, um, hobosymbols.com, there's a little story that I read that I wrote there uh, about when I was 16 in, uh, and I hopped a uh, train. Um, so that's kind of a, you know, if you need a fun little read, just spend a little time. Um, that That's something I put there for entertainment. It's a true story, but 
I put that there for entertainment, so that's a little bait to get people to to go over and, and read the story at hobosymbols.com. <laughs> Very good, very good. Well, Ben, I mean, it was uh, it was an honor speaking to you. Uh, I want to thank you so much for you know, for, thank you for your service uh, in writing that uh, in writing Sedition, Subversion, and Sabotage. I think especially the uh, you know the the focus on the use of force issues is great, and I hope we we hope we see more of that uh, in the libertarian and anarchist community here in the future, uh, and just de definitely be ideal. And also, uh, uh, you know, best of luck with uh, you know Freedom Bed and Breakfast. Uh, looking forward to to that launching, and uh, I think that's going to. Um, you know, uh, there's definitely a demand for it. So uh, thank you so much uh, for the conversation, Ben. Uh, uh, it was a great discussion. Uh, any Anything else? I just want to thank you again for, you know, doing all the legwork and getting the recording done to to record the book. I, I cannot – there just do not exist words to explain uh, how much that means to me that people took that kind of an interest in it and, uh, and did that because I, I think that is the single best way to get it out in audio form. Uh, people can download it. They can listen to it in their car when they're commuting or, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's just the perfect way. And I really appreciate you, you folks doing that for me. Not a problem, but not a problem. And if there's anything else that uh, we can do, just uh, you know, just just or anything else I can do, just uh, just let me know. I'm always here to help. So, thanks. Okay, and uh, there you have it, uh, Ben Stone, the Bad Quaker. Uh, we certainly hope you enjoyed it. Uh, make sure to check out the website, libertyunderattack.com. You can find a vast amount of resources, uh, the audiobook for Ben's book, extensive archives, my articles, and much, much more. I think that's all we have for you. Thanks so much for tuning in. Political crusading has never and will never set the slave free. It's time for direct action. Laissez faire. Liberty under attack dot com.